I'm delighted to come talk to you about uh, the exploration of mercury and a project that has been uh, going now for about 11 years. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that the man who got me into the field of geophysics is sitting in this audience who gave me my first geophysics class at the top of our Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a few facts to bring everybody up to speed on the planet Mercury, which of course is one of the sister inner planets to our Earth. But it is the smallest, uh, the inner planet, and uh, the last three years has been the smallest planet. Um, but we think that all of the inner planets form at about the same time by the same processes, and, and therefore studying all of them as a group uh, informs us much more about our own home planet than studying one planet at a time. Mercury is only 5% of the Earth's mass, but it is very dense. It's got the same bulk density as the Earth, from which we infer that Mercury is mostly iron metal. It's got a core that's at least 60% of its mass. For reference, the Earth's core is only 30%. And Mercury is the only inner planet other than Earth that has its own global magnetic field. And a big mystery is why such a small planet uh, still has a global magnetic field. But because most of Mercury's energy is impossible, models for Mercury not look like it's not. Most of it is iron metal. Uh, some of it is molten, some of it may be solid. Uh, but the silicate shell, a rock, that surrounds that core is at most 300 kilometers thick. It's not very thick. Uh, in contrast, the Earth's core is nearly 3,000 kilometers below the surface. Uh, so one is already much closer to the core of Mercury uh, at Mercury's surface than we, we can ever be at Earth. The only spacecraft prior to the messenger to visit Mercury was one of the Mariner series, Mariner 10, the last in the series, which was launched in 1973 and encountered Mercury three times, flying by at uh, intervals six months apart. Um, and, and taught us much of what we know about Mercury, and here's a very short list of what Mariner 10 taught us. Mariner 10 saw the same side of Mercury in sunlight at each encounter. So it imaged only about half the surface of the left. It discovered Mercury's global magnetic field. It detected the first three species in Mercury's atmosphere. A technical term for the very tenuous atmosphere that Mercury has is an exosphere. An exosphere is an atmosphere where the density is so low that the individual atoms don't know they have neighbors. They don't collide. They just follow uh, trajectories governed by their temperature and uh, the gravity field that's holding them to the planet. And uh, Mercury, by virtue of having a magnetic field, has an envelope of space in which that magnetic field is dominant, called the magnetosphere, as does the Earth is protecting us even now from charged particles uh, from the sun and from the galaxy. Uh, and Mercury has such a magnetosphere, but it's tiny and it's extremely time variable. So that's what Mariner 10 taught us. First base astronomy gave us the rest of what we knew about Mercury prior to the Messenger mission, and here's an abbreviated list. It was Earth based radar that taught us that Mercury is in what's called a spin orbit residence, meaning that there's a commensurability between the day and the year, the spin rate and the revolution around the sun or around the primary. The most common spin orbit residence in the solar system is what's called one to one in orbit resonance or synchronous rotation. The Earth's moon is in synchronous rotation, and that's why we see the same face of the moon to within a few degrees at all time. And there's a front side and a back side. Mercury's resonance is 3 2. Three days equals two years. That's very unusual. We don't know any other solar system body with that spin orbit resonance. It means that the solar day on Mercury, the time it takes for the sun to go through two successive passages overhead, is two Mercury years about six months or uh, Earth-based astronomers discovered other species in Mercury's atmosphere, including sodium, potassium, and calcium. These are somewhat unusual species for a planetary atmosphere. These must be derived from Mercury's surface. They're too abundant to come from the sun. We'll come back to that topic. Um, Earth-based radar discovered almost 20 years ago that Mercury has polar deposits. And here's an image of Mercury's polar deposits at one pole. These are radar-bright materials that have a radar backscatter and a radar depolarization that is best matched in the solar system by only one material, water ice. 
And it's somewhat paradoxical that the planet closest to the sun might have water, ice, and coal. And the reason is that the spin axis of Mercury uh, is almost perpendicular to its orbital plane. And areas that are topographically low, like impact craters, at the poles, never see the sun. They're in permanent shadow. And because the atmosphere is so thin, there's no transport of heat from the planet's equator to the pole, like occurs on Earth. And so the regions of permanent shadow look out into black space. They're extremely cold, much colder than the recent point of ice. And if there's a way to get water to the surface of Mercury, some of that water will find itself in the permanently shadowed polar crater floor. So that's the hypothesis to explain the radar data, but we'd like to test that with messages. And finally, a radar discovered three years ago uh, by an argument uh, having to do with the variation in the rotation over a Mercury year. That Mercury's outer core, like that of the Earth, must be whole. Just a brief word about NASA's discovery uh, program um, of, of small competed missions, uh, one of which was led uh, by Don Brownlee, the Stardust mission had a, a wonderful success, Tom's in this audience. Um, these are missions that are competed every few years, uh, constrained by cost, by schedule, and by launch vehicle, but otherwise open to the community to propose interesting ideas that must be scientifically challenging and technically not challenging. It must be technically ready and feasible. Uh, and it's produced uh, these first uh, 10 uh, missions that you see here, plus the real mission, which comes to the slide. Um, so what, what is unusual for NASA about these missions is that they're led by a scientist, a professor at the University of Washington, or a scientist at the Carnegie Institution, rather than a NASA center. And uh, they all must have ambitious goals, and the goals of the messenger mission was to answer these questions. Um, how did Mercury end up so dense? They go back to the planet forming process. Uh, what is the geological history of Mercury, and how does that compare to its sister inner planets, including Earth and Venus and Mars? Why does Mercury have a magnetic field and Mars and Venus don't, but the Earth does? And what has that got to do with the structure of, the, of Mercury's core and how much of it is molten? Are the radar reflective materials at the poles indeed water ice? And what's happening with this very dynamic exosphere and volatile species in general this close to the sun? Well. The argument we made was that not only are these questions important for Mercury, but they tell us about the family of all the inner planets, if we can answer them, and that these questions are capable of being answered by instruments that we place in orbit around Mercury. That was the argument. They bought the argument at NASA, and they bought the spacecraft. Um, but there's a reason why no spacecraft has ever visited, has ever orbited Mercury before. And that's because it faces two major technical challenges. Start taking notes. Um, and they, they are depicted by this image of Mercury transiting the sun, which it does with great frequency every uh, uh, decade or so, uh, uneven in space. This is 2003. Uh, it is a very small object by comparison to a very hot, hot object nearby. Um, and as a result, it uh, it is a challenge dynamically in terms of celestial mechanics to go and send a spacecraft from the Earth toward the Sun and go into orbit around an object only 5% of Earth's mass. That requires a big change in the spacecraft speed, what the uh, spacecraft engineers call delta V. How much you have to change the velocity of the spacecraft relative to your target to be captured into orbit. And for Mercury, that's like 10 kilometers a second. That would be the speed that the spacecraft would have flying on a direct a planetary transfer orbit from the Earth to Mercury if you did nothing else but allow uh, Newton's laws to uh, follow their inevitable conclusion. So you've got to come up with some way. Uh, we don't have anywhere near a propulsion system that can do this change in a single burn. Some way to solve this problem. And the other problem is the sun is, of course, very hot. And so the environment at Mercury is a big challenge to thermal design of spacecraft that depend on electronics, simply silicon-based electronics, which don't operate very well at temperatures as close to the sun. So that's the second challenge that must be met. And prior to Messenger, uh, no spacecraft concept have adequately solved these problems. 
how does Betten to solve them? With a variety of ways, and I won't go into all of them here, but to some extent the spacecraft addresses both challenges. Um, it addresses the thermal challenge of the sun by pointing a sunshade at the sun at all times. That sunshade is made out of a ceramic cloth with some uh, multi layers of insulation behind it um, and is pointed at the sun at all times. Uh, the solar arrays take advantage of being close to the sun but have to operate at uh, control temperatures and so it uses mirrors and articulation to control that temperature. Uh, in order to get the high delta V, the spacecraft required all dry mass on the spacecraft had to be reduced to uh, low values and then it was done through a very thoughtful integration of the propulsion system and the structure from an early stage, uh, reducing, uh, choosing materials that were low in mass and uh, reducing mass wherever possible. Uh, the, the communication system itself is low mass and based on an electronically steerable uh, phased array without movable parts. The mission design addressed the need for this large delta V for changing the velocity of the spacecraft enough so that the propulsion system we can carry can do orbit insertion. Now this is a pretty complicated diagram. It's looking down from the North Pole of the plane of the Earth and the other most of the other planets at the trajectory that messenger takes from launch to orbit insertion. And what you see is that there are many, many orbits around the sun, 15. And here's a timeline at the bottom going from launch to orbit insertion, that's 6.6 .6 years, with some milestones along the way. And those are critical. Uh, there are two kinds. There's ones that look like a planet, and there are these triangles. The triangles are planned major propulsive events, changing the trajectory of the spacecraft and targeting it for the next planetary flyby. And the planet symbol to note the fact that the spacecraft flew by first Earth and then Venus twice and then Mercury three times, using each of these flybys to change the trajectory in a way that brought the relative velocity of the spacecraft closer and closer uh, to a, a small enough number relative to Mercury that our propulsion system could do over the search. So each of these flybys was an opportunity for science, but it was absolutely critical for getting into orbit around Mercury. And right now we're about here on this timeline. We've had all six flybys, all five planetary events, and we're looking forward to orbit insertion around Mercury in about uh, 11 months. Um, but without this very clever mission design, we could not have done an orbital mission. Uh, and uh, these kinds of techniques have been known for maybe 25 years, um, but this is the first time they're being put into effect for a Mercury. Here's a uh, summary of some testing we did to validate the thermal design, and in particular, uh, all of the components that had to operate uh, uh, facing the sun. Uh, this is a small portion of sunshade material with a uh, high-gain antenna uh, and some other devices that had to see through the sunshade. Taken to a big vacuum chamber in NASA Glen in Cleveland and subjected uh, the temperature measured to increasing intensity, simulating proximity to the sun, and measured in number of suns, where one sun is what you see uh, from orbit around the Earth, um, and uh, 11 suns is what you see at Mercury when it is closest to the sun at the very beginning. And here you, see, here you see the validation of the thermal design and the testing. The front of the shade uh, ramps up at 11 suns to a temperature of about 350 degrees centigrade. That would fry any of the electronics on our spacecraft. The back of the shade down here is almost insensitive to solar illumination on the front side. It's room temperature. So this was an excellent design. Uh, and it is a challenge to the spacecraft to keep the sunshade pointed at the sun at all times. That's another topic. But the sunshade itself does its job. It did it in Cleveland, and it does it around the sun today. Uh, we carry seven scientific instruments that are designed to answer the questions that frame the mission. Some of these have multiple components. They're illustrated here. Uh, there's an imaging system uh, that has a, a scan platform uh, that gives it another degree of freedom in pointing. But every other instrument is mounted in a fixed manner to the spacecraft. And if you want to look in a different direction, you turn the spacecraft. Substitute a constraint that the sunshade must always be between the sun and the spacecraft. So what else is aboard? 
Uh, there are two devices that are elemental remote sensing. One looking at gamma rays, both naturally emitted, and one uh, that are uh, stimulated by the interaction of cosmic rays with materials on the surface of Mercury and are uh, uh, generated there at specific energies, diagnostic of individual uh, elements uh, that are major rock forming elements. There's an X ray spectrometer that looks at X-rays excited by solar X-radiation. Um, again, that come off uh, the surface at energies that are diagnostic of specific elements there. Uh, that is to say when the sun is active at X-ray wavelengths. There's a laser altimeter that will look at topography of the shape of the planet and also the response of the planet to variations of uh, solar torque uh, during its orbit. There's a magnetometer. There it is. That's at the end of the three and a half meter boom to get it away from what is already a magnetically flat spacecraft. Uh, there are two energetic particle spectrometers, one at high energies, one at plasma energies. And there's a remarkable double duty, very high spectral resolution spectrometer that looks at the atmosphere, where there are emission lines, diagnostic of individual species in the atmosphere, and at the surface, uh, looking for mineralogical absorption features in the surface reflectors from the ultraviolet through the very near infrared. We, of course, launched. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if you ever have a chance to go to a, a, a launch at uh, Cape Kennedy, uh, take advantage of the invitation. Uh, a nighttime launch, even of a Delta II, much less something like a space shuttle, is absolutely terrific. And of course, if you've got a spacecraft aboard, uh, it's a very warm feeling to see a successful launch. This is a depiction of the three flybys. Uh, two of them were in 2008, and one was September last year. I remember that these flybys were necessary so that we can do the orbit insertion uh, next year, in March of 2011, but we were able to accomplish a great deal of science uh, at each of these flybys. They all go from left to right. There's Mercury looking down from the North Pole. The, uh, the side facing the sun is shown in sort of daylight. In terms of that terminated. Um, the closest approach was 200 kilometers in all cases, always on the night side. So we're approaching from the anti sunward direction up the magnetic trail. Um, and we're looking back at the mostly sunlit surface as we depart from each of these encounters. Uh, and we saw uh, almost opposite hemispheres illuminated in these first two flybys. So we've seen a lot of the planets just from these flybys, and we've utilized all of the instruments aboard. And I'll talk about some of the results from these flyby measurements as we look at him to orbit insertion. <coughs> this is our first approach put together as an animation. This, this was really an exciting time. Right? It's been the first time a spacecraft has visited Mercury uh, in almost 33 years. Uh, we were able to carry uh, instruments that hadn't been uh, invented for sharpen in their capabilities in over three decades of technology. Um, and so we were able to measure a lot of things for the first time. Uh, all of the flybys uh, worked well, uh, not equally well, particularly the third flyby, but we did have a sample. But they all worked well in terms of returning large data sets, uh, a lot of images, and a lot of data from all of the instruments aboard. Um, and as a result, we were able to do a lot of things for the first time in Virginia. I won't be these, but you can see examples. Uh, in terms of close approach, in terms of uh, the first spacecraft observations of uh, what I will describe in a minute, Mer uh, Mercury's neutral scale, comet like scale, uh, first measurement of uh, plasma ions in the magnetic sphere, later alchemical energy, uh, spectroscopy, etc. Um, if you visit a planet for the first time in over three decades, there's lots of things you can do for the first time. Okay, results. Let me say a few words about the magnetic field of Mercury. We remember that Mercury is the only inner planet other than Earth to have a magnetic field. We don't yet know why, but one of the ways to get at this question is to measure the geometry of the field. Um, here you see, looking down on the North Pole of the planet, are, are, are the passes that Mariner 10 made. There were two inside the one below that is dominated by Mercury's magnetic field, the magnetic field. Uh, and the first two flybys by Messenger. And, and what was important is that they were on opposite sides of the planet. And so they allowed us for the first time uh, to see something about how symmetric 
field was as a function of longitude. And here you see some depictions of total field strength. The spacecraft came in from the left, uh, got inside the body of space dominated by Mercury's magnetic field, and saw the magnetic field of the planet. We looked, by the way, for strongly magnetized portions of the crust. Those have been seen on Mars at very high altitudes. They can be seen from Earth orbit uh, for some uh, continental scale magnetic anomalies. Uh, so far, we haven't seen any at Mercury. We will be looking. Um, this is a way that magnetic field scientists display the solution for what the, the geometry of the field is. And uh, it's a little arcane for those who are not in the field. Um, this is the geometry of the total field at the uniform altitude above the surface of 200 kilometers. This is the geometry of the component of the field that points outward, the radial component, at the core mantle boundary. And what you look for is, is a it's one color in the north and one color in the south, and that's the field of a dipole, the field of a bar magnet, a large one, at the center of the planet. Uh, and what you can see is that to first order, Mercury's magnetic field is that of a bar magnet, a dipole, that's aligned with the spin axis. But there are some important variations, and you can pretty see them here, variations in longitude, and differences uh, in the two hemispheres that uh, indicate that there are other components negative field, what the negative field people call higher order uh, components, and they're telling us something about the source of the field. But the, the fact that we saw no crustal magnetic anomalies to date, that the field is dominantly that of a dipole, that it strongly aligns with the spin axis, are all votes in favor of Mercury's magnetic field being generated more or less like that of the Earth by convective motions in the electrically conducted fluid metal core. So we think that this is a magnetic field generated by what's called a dynamo, uh, albeit one that produces a much weaker field than on Earth, uh, analogous to that in Earth, but probably with some important differences we hope to resolve with measurements made from orbit. Uh, it's just a message that it's a complicated business. In the absence of the sun and the stream of charged particles, plasma, that uh, uh, leaves the sun at all times, solar wind, and the magnetic field, the interplanetary magnetic field carried by that solar wind, the magnetic field of Mercury might look like this. Dominantly dipolar field lines that go from one pole to the other. Nice geometry. You can figure this out easily for orbit. But the real field lines look something like this. They're strongly influenced by the solar wind, uh, and that solar wind uh, and the field that goes along with it uh, changes in ways that have a dramatic uh, response at Mercury's magnetosphere. And so the challenge to understanding the uh, internal field is to separate out the time variable dynamic components of the field <coughs> from those that are steady and arising from the interior. The challenge to understanding uh, the time variable part is to understand Mercury's magnetosphere dynamics, all of the currents and quantitatively how those uh, structures and current systems change in response to solar wind conditions. It's a wonderful laboratory for studying magnetic fields, magnetic, uh, fields and magnetospheres that are broadly Earth-like, but have some very, very important differences, and we look forward to, to those uh, efforts as we go into orbit. So broadly, the magnetic field is that of the dipole. It's well matched to both the Mariner 10 and Messenger observations, uh, and so far we see nothing in the way now turning to the exosphere. The exosphere is this very tenuous atmosphere, and it's made up uh, mostly of, it's got hydrogen and helium from the solar wind, but mostly it's heavy atoms that have been uh, removed from the surface of Mercury and are still influenced by Mercury's gravitational field. Uh, on the left is a cartoon of some of the processes thought to be important for, for moving atoms from the surface into the exosphere. Uh, sunlight uh, and heat from the sun, uh, direct impact of the surface by ions, say from the solar wind or from the magnetosphere, uh, and direct impact of the surface by, by dust particles and small meteorites, all of which are capable of freeing material from the surface uh, to the exosphere. And then the particles, remember they don't collide, uh, follow ballistic trajectories, and if they have high enough energies, they get high above the planet. If they don't, they come back down somewhere else on the planet. Well, if they're high enough, they're also influenced by sunlight. 
by the pressure of solar radiation. And that solar radiation pressure can push these energetic atoms away from the sun and in the anti-sunward direction. And they leave the gravitational field of Mercury and they form a comet-like tail. So let me show you what that tail looks like. We carry a high spectral resolution spectrometer. Remember, it's tied to the, uh, it's, it's fixed to the spacecraft. And start, and then so I think we can't see the scary here. Um, as we flew in, uh, this one from the first flyby, um, these are individual spot measurements of the in column intensity of emission at one of the lines of sodium. These lines are excited by sunlight and then re-emitted as a scattering phenomenon. And the sun direction is to the left, and this is the tail direction. These observations can then be contoured, and you have a map of the intensity of sodium emission uh, with some line of sight influence on the numbers uh, in, in the near planet part of this, this tail. This tail has been seen from Earth to extend at least a thousand planetary radii. So it, it's a big phenomenon, uh, much like uh, on the second flyby, we made observations at, of this tail in other wavelengths, diagnostic of uh, calcium, which has been seen from Earth, and in a search for another species that can't be seen from Earth because its emission is in the ultraviolet, where the atmosphere gets in the way. Um, but uh, these species show uh, that they're there in the tail, but they have a different distribution with latitude and distance, indicating that there's a, a mix of source processes uh, that's giving rise to this different geometry for these different species, suggesting that there's a rich uh, opportunity to understand all of these processes by looking at multiple species and different times. And one hint that time matters is this uh, comparative plot of the sodium tail uh, during the second flyby and the third flyby, plotted on the same scale. The sodium tail is almost invisible here. It's down by a factor of about 20. And it has to do with the greater distance that Mercury was from the sun and the different speed uh, that Mercury was making relative uh, to, uh, to, to particles and radiation from the sun uh, at this position relative to this position. So the excitation of emission was different uh, in, the, in this setting and, and uh, it speaks uh, to uh, the strong variations that can be expected during the Mercury year. And what we're looking forward to is being at Mercury, taking uh, these kinds of snapshots of what's going on in the atmosphere throughout uh, uh, a Mercury year, at different times of the day, and at different levels of activity in the sun. We were also able to measure uh, ionized particles in Mercury. You experience this cartoon view of Mercury's trajectory on its first flyby through the magnetosphere of Mercury, produced by colleagues at the University of Michigan. Uh, shows the geometry at top and shows you two plots of plasma ions at the bottom. The top plot are solar wind plasma, dominantly photons, and the bottom plot are heavy ions, dominantly uh, ionized, singly ionized sodium. And you see that the, particularly the protons are seen throughout uh, the magnetosphere as uh, the spacecraft traverse, traverses the magnetosphere. And you see some peaks in the heavy ions, uh, particularly at, at one of the magnetospheric boundaries and the closest approach. Well, these kinds of data uh, are, are a rich source of information on the interaction of Mercury with the solar wind and on those components of the, uh, ex the exosphere that have become ionized by ultraviolet and other processes that are also telling us about material coming from Mercury's surface. This was an early spectrum from the first flyby of uh, ions cast in terms of mass per charge from a time of light component on one of the energetic particle spectrometers or plasma energy uh, and a fit to a particular set of spectrum show, uh, spectra uh, showing peaks for sodium and uh, uh, silicon and uh, other species uh, that uh, are well fitted cast in uh, to uh, this particular zone uh, spectrum. Uh, through telling us that this is the way, uh, as we get better statistics and uh, uh, more time inside the magnetosphere, that we will be able to make an inventory of the charge species uh, throughout Mercury's exosphere and magnetosphere.
Mercury uh, Messenger operated its altimeter during the two of the first three flybys. Um, here you see an altimetric profile from the very first flyby, five kilometers of, of topographic range, uh, and a lot of short wavelength features, some of which then we only had for comparison this, this uh, Arecibo radar image that we've since imaged with our own imaging system. And features like these are impact craters, and we can determine depths, and we've also overflow uh, tectonic features, faults. I'll talk to a couple of those later. Um, this just shows that we've now built up images uh, for regions uh, around uh, the two profiles we have from out there. This is the coverage of imaging. Uh, we now have imaged with uh, Messenger uh, more than 80% of the planet, uh, nearly 90%. And when you throw in the images from Area 10, shown in green, 98% of her has been imaged. Everything except some of the regions close to the pole. Now, it hasn't been evenly imaged uh, in terms of lighting or resolution, uh, but we know most of what's on Mercury's surface at some level. And this is a very important knowledge as we uh, head into into orbit. A few words about color, because now I'm going to talk about the imaging that we've done. Mercury is pretty gray, and this is an image looking back at Mercury after the first flyby, uh, at close to what your eye would see had you been on the spacecraft. And you, those of you with sharp vision, color, acuity, and sitting in the front row, can tell that uh, these pictures are a little bluer than the others, and that they're in here. And a little redder than this, but uh, these are all digital data and they can be enhanced by image processing methods. My colleagues uh, on the image processing team addressed the question of how many types of units can you see on the surface of Mercury on the basis of color and brightness? And the answer from the first slide I was six, uh, they're listed here, they don't need to know their names. But that means that all of the areas that were imaged during that first slide by fall into one of six groups on the basis of color, meaning the slope of the reflectance spectrum, and overall brightness, or average reflectance. And we think these variations mean differences in composition. And we think that areas that have the same color and brightness are approximately the same composition. But at this stage, we don't have chemical information. That will have to come when we go into orbit. A different way of projecting the same information, different choices of colors, now comparing the first flyby and the second flyby shows that the color units are about the same. That the, that the groupings that we needed to characterize all the regions seen in the first flyby were adequate to describe everything we saw in color and brightness in the second flyby. So from that point of view, the two halves of mergers are about the same. A little bit more on what these features mean. Um, of course, we have high resolution spectra of many areas on the surface. They all look something like this. They, this is now going from ultraviolet wavelengths to near-infrared wavelengths. This is the ratio of the brightness of mercury to the brightness of the sun, or the reflectance. But these curves are very, very smooth. And for comparison, you see some plots from the moon and from some asteroids uh, that show absorption bands, places where the reflectance uh, has a local minimum. And those are due to mineralogical effects that are diagnostic, depending on the wavelength, of particular minerals on the Surface. So, for instance, we know that all of these features are due to absorption in silicates that contain some iron, some paragon. Um, and even in the lunar highlands, uh, this Apollo 16 site, uh, you can see this band, although it's very, very weak. Well, this band is not seen at Mercury, and none of the spectra we have obtained shows that this is a mineralogical absorption feature. So, unlike the moon and most asteroids, and most planetary surfaces that have hard surfaces, there's not much iron in the silicates of Mercury. I'll come back to that. I want to talk about uh, volcanism next. And I want to start with this type area. This is the large impact feature called Aurora, half of which was imaged before by Mariner 10, but this area was in darkness. We filled it in with Messenger, showed it to be a somewhat larger feature. It's the largest well-preserved impact feature on Mercury at about 1,500 kilometers in diameter. But I don't just show it for itself alone. It turns out to be a region that's extraordinarily interesting from the point of view of the later evolution of the planet as the basin gets looked at. First of all, there's an important difference uh, that shows up in spectra and color. 
of planes here, the smooth areas, uh, both inside the basin, high reflectance red plane, and surrounding the basin on the outside, low reflectance blue plane. These are all very smooth, and find that they're deposits of very low viscosity materials. Um, but the in inside material is brighter and redder, or cheaply close, than the outside material. So we think that they're different compositions. I uh, think you see the range of the plethora for, for different types of areas of mercury, including the and me. And what's important is not so much that they're different in composition, because we don't know what that composition means, uh, but they're also different in age. And they're different in age from the basin itself. And that's determined on mercury, not because we have any samples that we can be able to laboratory, but on the basis of the density of impact craters that have been accumulated on the surface. The longer a surface has been around, the more craters it should have. Because craters are pretty random, they hit all parts of the planet. And the, these are plots, with a, some information removed, of the density of impact craters. And the red and the green here compare the planes inside and outside. And they're, they're pretty close to each other. If anything, the inside planes have a few more craters than the outside planes. But here's a comparison between the uh, outside planes and the basin itself is measured by craters on the rim of the basin. And what you see is for these craters, 150, 200 kilometers in diameter, there's a lot more of them per area uh, on the basin rim than there are on the plane. So the planes are younger than the basin. We don't know about the amount, but we know it's resolvably younger, meaning that they're not related to the basin and its formation, and they're planes, so they're most likely uh, the remnants of volcanic eruption, very fluid volcanic eruption that occurred after, well after, the basin itself formed. Uh, but there's some other evidence for volcanic origin. Surrounding Caloris are these reddish areas, the fused red spots, two different versions of the same color information. Here is one of these red spots in a high resolution. <coughs> uh, it's got the irregular depression, it's surrounded by bright material. Um, here on this large plot. Um, these diffuse deposits uh, overlie older uh, crater form deposits, in some cases all the way up to the rim of those craters. Uh, there's an apparent slope away from the center and down. Here you see the scale. Uh, the best analog for this kind of feature anywhere in the solar system are these uh, lunar Mare domes. Uh, and closer to the scale, the center uh, irregular depression, the distinctive color of the deposits around them. These are sources of volcanic eruptions on the moon, and moreover, they're sources of pyroplastic or uh, explosive volcanic eruptions, and I'll come back to the importance of that interest. But this is the volcanic center, the first clearly identified on Mercury. Uh, not necessarily the center for all of the planes inside the colors, but, but a distinct center of volcanic eruptions. And if you look at the other diffuse red spots around cores, you see that they share many characteristics in terms of the central irregular depression and uh, distinctive colors <coughs> and boundaries that are irregular and diffuse. Now, why is that important? Uh, it is important because uh, it says something about how mercury was assembled. Uh, Explosive volcanic eruptions on Earth, and it is thought on the Moon and on Mars, require that the eruptive magnets have some volatile material. It might be water, it might be a compound carbon dioxide or monoxide, uh, it might be some other species. Uh, but that volatile species uh, uh, comes out of solution with the magnet, the magnet rises and goes to lower pressures, uh, and if that volatile is trapped in the magnet, it can drive conditions uh, toward ones that favor explosive eruptions. And the expectation was that mercury would not have a lot of volatiles inside, that it was born of high temperature processes peculiar to conditions very near the sun, and ones that gave rise to an uh, unusual bulk composition for the planet, one that was dominated by an iron core. So we didn't know much about volatiles before Messenger. We, we did know that uh, mercury has an exosphere that has species like sodium and potassium that aren't expected to be in abundance uh, in the inner solar system because they're volatile species. 
Uh, we've also now flown through Mercury's ionized exosphere and seen species indicative of all. But of course, that just speaks to the surface of Mercury and the source of the exosphere and not to what's inside. Uh, we also know that the outer core of Mercury is molten, and we know that a completely iron core would have solidified over the history of the solar system on the basis of theory. So there ought to be a light element, and maybe it's a volatile element. Sulfur is a candidate because it's commonly thought to be important to the Earth's outer core. But this indication that Mercury has pyroclastic eruption, explosive volcanic eruption, puts the finger in at least these locations that there must be water or some other volume uh, that was at depth at the time these magmas were formed by melting uh, of subsurface silicates. Um, and so that requires that however mercury was formed, that some volatiles were left inside. So that was an important result. Uh, just one other comment on volcanism comes from altimetry. You see a comparison of two impact craters next to each other. Uh, one of them was a very deep floor. One of them you can barely see in the altimetry because it's been completely flooded. <coughs> right next to each other, same diameter, very different profiles from the gallery. Volcanic, mostly volcanic, and we can't say they all are volcanic, but the plain boundary are uh, aerially and volumetrically very important. They cover at least 40% of the surface. Uh, we know in many cases they are volcanic. We know on the basis of spectral information they can be several kilometers thick. Uh, they span the range of colors seen on the surface. Uh, and where we can make a case on the basis of crater density or particular landforms, uh, most of these planes are volcanic. So it says that at least 40% of the planet, it would take some uncertainty, uh, has a volcanic origin. Uh, we learned from the third flyby uh, that uh, uh, there are portions of Mercury we've seen for the first time last fall that are telling us new things about the volcanic history. Uh, this bright area with an irregular depression in the middle, we don't have very high resolution information yet. We will from orbit. It's a candidate for being the largest expanse of pyroclastic deposits on the planet. Uh, we'll see if that's the right answer. This basin was seen for the first time. The center of it uh, is extraordinarily smooth. It's distinct in color from its surroundings. It's almost no impact crater. This itself is a fairly young, uh, two ring basin, almost 300 kilometers in diameter. But the central plains have to be volcanic because uh, they're, they're younger than the basin in which they lie and they're different in composition and they have almost no craters, meaning that we're looking at what may be the youngest volcanic that I've seen so far on Mercury. And that's just from the third fire. A few words on faults, and then I'll bring this to a close. Uh, most of the faults on Mercury are contraction. It was like shortening of the crust. And the, these contractional faults are everywhere. They were seen from Mary McKinn. They were predicted to be seen everywhere from Messenger. We've seen them. And what this means is in order to get contraction everywhere, you've got to have the planet shrink. So Mercury is the incredible shrinking planet. The evidence are these global systems of huge faults, some of which are kilometers high. Here's an example of why we think they're contraction. There are many now examples where there are impact craters that predate the tectonic activity. If you look in detail, here is that spark. There's only half of that crater left because this side of the fault has moved up and over the other half of this crater. So this crater predated it, used to be round, half of it's missing uh, because the entire crust has been shortened. And for a variety of reasons for that, I don't have time to go into. Um, the amount of shrinkage uh, is growing as we, as we come up with better ways of estimating the, the uh, shortening across individual falls and are able to see falls for the first time that expand the uh, range of those features. It's also intriguing that uh, some of the most highly deformed areas on Mercury are the centers of great impact basins, indicating that the basin came along and blasted a big hole in the planet filled it up in some cases partly with volcanic deposits, but then became a focus for continued activity, uh, including deformation, that gave rise to some of the uh, most spectacular uh, fault type structures that we see today, including most of the extensional deformation, the structure deformation that we see at the planetary surface. And here's a wonderful example that we saw from the first slide. This is the center of the great Colorus Basin that I showed you earlier. There happens to be 
40 millimeter uh, diameter impact crater in the middle, but what is spectacular are the 200 or so radiating troughs that go out for hundreds of kilometers away from this more or less uh, symmetric pattern. And we don't know why they're there. They are pretty much in the center of the core space. And here you see some ideas uh, that people are exploring with quantitative models. But it's telling us that this basin was under extension, it stretched, and it did so in a way that gave rise to very uniform uh, spacing of these troughs, pull apart uh, troughs that radiate out from the center of this basin. So that this kind of structure has a lot to tell us about how the planet deformed over time. Just in the last slide, we saw one example, a bit small, of stretching that was unrelated to an impact basin. It is these troughs here that continue over here. Uh, it's not in the middle of the basin. It's, in fact, on the top of an elevated block or plateau that maybe got stretched by virtue of, uh, of some relaxation of the plateau, some expansion of the footprint of the plateau after the, the forces that produce the plateau stopped operating. It's common on Earth. It has not been seen on other planets. We may be seeing it for the first time at Mercury in these tectonic structures. I want to close with an animation that's put up together uh, by these high-resolution color frames that were taken on the second flight. We came out of the dark side of the planet as we, as we moved away from the planet. We used all of the filters in the imaging system to put together a color view. Now, there are some artifacts having, have, across the whole thread having to do with photometric uh, differences that haven't been illuminated. But flying over this region, simulated, um, the remedy that the colors are, are enhanced uh, and stretched gives you a sense for the color variation and how they are related to impact structures, to tectonic structures, to plane structures from the planet. Uh, I'll point out a few examples where uh, you see the marvelous tectonic structure that a couple of them that run through this big structure. Uh, areas that are relatively blue, areas that are relatively red. Um, and some of them, many of them, can be tied to aspects of the impact structure. This is a central peak region that is bluer than the uh, orange or red rim material, all different from the brown material surrounding it, indicating that impact structure excavated see this throughout. Here's a primarily blue or brown area, a big enough crater punches through, and up comes some red material. Here's a lot of blue material that was excavated by a boulder impact structure. Uh, here's some blue material, but if you get impact craters, you can punch through and see some red material. Uh, that's really close up. By saying that the implication of that kind of material uh, this was a very volcanic reaction planet.